This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 55. In this episode, I will continue the history of the 100 milers that have taken place for more than 300 years. In part one of this series, episode 54, I shared the very early attempts to reach this ultra distance milestone on foot. A hundred miles, a hundred miles, a hundred miles, a hundred miles. You can hear the whistle blow a hundred miles. By 1867, walking 100 miles in a go started to receive intense attention, especially in America. A multi-year 100-mile frenzy was launched. In this episode, the 100-mile craze expands. In 1878, thanks to those in England, the 100-miler opened up to runners who could go as they pleased, rather than sticking to a strict heel-toe walking style that was emphasized in America. That year, well over 100 successful 100-mile finishes were accomplished with times that fell dramatically as the 100-mile athletes learned to trot. Also that year, women especially left their mark on the 100-mile sport in America as the country became fascinated with their accomplishments. The most prolific 100-milers in 1878 were women. Samuel Clemens, or Mark Twain, even joined in the 100-mile craze. Called by many the father of American literature, Mark Twain was born Samuel Langhorne Clemens on November 30th, 1835, in Missouri. He attempted to walk 100 miles from Hartford, Connecticut to Boston, Massachusetts in two days with his pastor, J.H. Twitchell. The two had taken many 10-mile walks together to enjoy social chat and exchange views. They would always return home from these walks with jaw ache, but were never foot sore. So they hoped to walk all the way to Boston to store up enough jaw to last them through the winter. The two started on November 19th, 1874 in the morning. After 10 hours and 28 miles, they stopped for the night. It was reported, Before retiring, they had a consultation and decided that their undertaking had developed into anything but a pleasure trip and was actually hard work. In the morning, they walked seven more miles for a total of 35 miles and then took the train to Boston. Twain said, My knee was so stiff that it was like walking on stilts. In 1874, Daniel O'Leary came into the 100-mile scene, stealing away much of the spotlight that had been on Edward Payson Weston. O'Leary was born in Ireland, and in 1866, like so many other Irish, he immigrated to America. He could not find work in New York City, so he settled in Chicago, worked in a lumberyard, and sold books door to door. He built up his endurance from speedwalking his routes. In 1874, O'Leary overheard a group discussing Weston's attempts to walk 100 miles in 24 hours. One person said that only a Yankee could accomplish the feat. O'Leary finally said that he thought he could beat Weston. They roared with laughter. O'Leary wanted to prove that an Irishman could be a successful distance walker too. He rented the West Side Brink in Chicago and announced that he would be attempting to walk 100 miles in 24 hours. O'Leary made his 100 mile try on July 14, 1874. Most of the bets were against his success. At the start he was greeted with a hearty round of cheering. It was reported, The area of the rink, which was scientifically surveyed, is 400 feet. 13 and one-fifth circuits make up a mile. O'Leary began at 8.35 p.m. At 15 miles, he was described as having The air of a man who was determined to conquer or die. His fuel during the walk was only ice water and brandy. O'Leary succeeded and finished in 23 hours 17 minutes. It was more than two hours slower than Weston's best, but he proved that an Irishman could walk 100 miles in less than 24 hours. He challenged Weston to a 250-mile walking match, but was brushed off by Weston, who said, 
Make a good record first, and meet me after. To further prove that he was better than Weston, at Philadelphia, O'Leary wanted to beat Weston's best time for 115 miles and leave him in the shadows. He succeeded, reaching the 115 miles in 22 hours 59 minutes, beating Weston's best time by an hour. Weston noticed, and a couple weeks later, in May 1875, he made an attempt in New York to reach 118 miles within 24 hours. He came up one mile short, reaching 117 miles, but reached 100 miles in 20 hours, one minute, without a rest. He was pleased that he beat O'Leary's 116 miles. Weston was so successful at staging these walking exhibitions all over the country that uh, competitors sprang up. I mean, it was inevitable. And uh, the most famous of them uh, was an uh, Irish immigrant from Chicago, a guy named Daniel O'Leary. And uh, he challenged Weston uh, to, a, to a match, to a walking match. And so eventually they met in a uh, five-day race in Chicago. Weston versus O'Leary for the walking championship of the world as it was billed. And 10,000 people a night would come watch. Yes, in November 1875, O'Leary and Weston finally competed head-to-head. -head. It was a six-day walking match held in the Exposition Building in Chicago. The building was massive, the largest enclosed public meeting space in the United States at that time. O'Leary reached 100 miles in the lead at 20 hours 48 minutes and went on to defeat Weston by 51 miles, finishing with 503 miles. Both became very rich men, dividing $11,000 of gate money evenly. That was worth a quarter million dollars in 2020 value. O'Leary's fame spread through Chicago and pedestrian fever caught fire across the city. It has wholly transformed the appearance of the streets. The sidewalks are now crowded with hurrying pedestrians all stepping forward, male and female, in true professional style with their heads thrown back and hands held up high, each apparently striving to achieve a six mile per hour gait. Streetcars pass along once in a while, but if they contain any passengers at all, they are cripples, weak and infirm old people, or shop boys with heavy bundles. Men can be seen with watches in their hands, timing themselves as they dart forward, and muttering strange words about minutes, seconds, and distances. During 1875, there were at least 20 successes by pedestrians in reaching 100 miles in 24 hours. Some of these achievements occurred in races. Nearly all of them were conducted indoors to charge spectators. Many of the early 100-mile races were busts, with no one finishing. Often races were stopped once there was only one man left standing. In 1875, a 100-mile race was billed as the Championship of America. It was held at the American Institute Hall in New York City. The competitors were George B. Coyle, the champion from Wisconsin, and William E. Harding of New York. The highly anticipated race was held on May 28, 1875, starting at 10.37 p.m. Both walked non-stop for the first 35 miles, with Harding in the lead. It was close when they reached 50 miles in about 11 hours 30 minutes. The exertion and fatigue were visible on both men, although Harding made an occasional spurt which won the applause of the large audience present during most of the day. But during the morning, Coyle suffered terribly. His limbs were chafed, felt sore, and a pain in his stomach and groin caused him intense agony. He quit at mile 75. Instead of finishing the race, Harding was declared the winner, reaching 78 miles in about 24 hours. Loser. In December 1878, the great 100-mile walking match was held in Belvedere, Illinois between Donahue and Cross at Union Hall. It didn't amount to much. They walked about 35 miles apiece and quit. The thing was also a failure financially. Loser. In 1876, the world-famous pedestrian Edward Payson Weston traveled to England to compete. His trip had a significant impact on the history of ultra-running. His visit stirred up pedestrian fever in that country. The British press wrote, At last Englishmen have had the opportunity of judging for themselves the capabilities of American walkers. 
They were skeptical about Weston's achievements and doubted that he could reproduce his efforts in England. Englishmen have refused to accept, without some confirmation, the accounts of long journeys traversed by Yankee Peds. Edward Payson Weston has arrived in England at an opportune moment to convince the skeptics and satisfy the curious. Weston was determined to prove his British skeptics wrong. For his first English race, Weston competed against William T. Perkins, the champion pedestrian of England. They raced in a 24-hour competition at the Agricultural Hall in London, England. Perkins was the wonder of the day among English walkers, the champion beyond all doubt at any distance up to 50 miles. He was known as the only man who had ever walked eight miles within an hour. Two tracks were measured out with gravel and sand put down on boards. The outside track was six and a half to a mile and the inside seven. Perkins chose to walk on the outside track. The race began at 9.25 p.m. Perkins immediately took the lead, going off with a capital stride. The English press commented, It at once became apparent that Perkins is far better than his opponent. Perkins' style is simply perfect, with long, rapid strikes, striking well out from the hips. He covers the ground at a tremendous pace and uses his arms in any way that seems to help him along. Weston, on the other hand, reminds one of a country farmer swinging along when trying to make up for lost time. They were allowed to reverse direction after any lap when reaching the judge's box. Both took advantage of that option often in order to avoid constantly working one leg. Perkins was the first to leave the track for some rest and refreshment after about six hours of constant walking with a four-mile lead. He feasted on mutton chop and drank a pint of Burton Ale. Perkins was leading by a mile at 54 miles but appeared much fatigued and Weston soon took the lead. Weston never left the track until about mile 70. He then took his first rest of only one minute and 20 seconds. Perkins quit after 65 miles because of bad blisters. His socks were saturated with blood and had to be cut off his swollen feet. That's nasty. The press still thought he was a hero. Perkins, though broke down, proved himself to be what all who know him have long thought of him, game to the backbone. Weston continued on alone and suffered through a period of vertigo and pain. He fueled on beef tea, beaten up eggs, toast, jelly, grapes, prunes, coffee, tea, milk, sugar, and diluted brandy. As he neared 100 miles, he increased his pace amidst the most enthusiastic cheers at his pluck and determination. He hit 100 miles in 19 hours, 20 minutes, and reached 109 miles in 24 hours. He caught the attention of the British. In England, 100-mile walking during that era was not very widely competed at the time, but the Brits started to train furiously. Despite Weston's early dominance in England, it was written, Nothing is more common than to hear opinions expressed to the effect that the recent performances of Mr. Edward Payson Weston, however marvelous they may be, are of no practical utility. Sour grapes, sour grapes, you got them sour grapes. Weston continued to compete in England in many distances greater than 100 miles. By May, the competition became greater as several Brits were able to walk sub-19 hour 100 milers in agricultural hall in larger races. O'Leary joined in competing internationally when he also went to England in 1877, beating Weston again in a head-to-head six-day race. 1878 was the year when the six-day race started to take some of the spotlight away from the 100 mile race. The first formal six-day race was held back in 1875 in New York, but the six-day really took off in 1878 when the Astley Belt Race was established. The first edition of this international race was held in the Agricultural Hall in London, England. To level the playing field, go-as-you-please rules were introduced to the sport of pedestrianism, which simplified officiating and reduced protest about rule-breaking due to walking form. Pedestrian historian P.S. Marshall explained, Competitors would be able to walk, trot, run, mix, lift, or introduce a new style of pedestrianism if clever enough. This was a decision made for two reasons, one of which was apparently because of Weston's wobbling gait, 
which was considered as not being textbook heel and toe. And the other was because there was a view that because the American athletes were so much better walking than their British counterparts, a method of progression was needed to be invented to disadvantage the best of those athletes. As more British long-distance runners extended their endurance to ultra-distances, they began to truly excel at distances of 100 miles and greater. The Agricultural Hall in London was the ultra-running venue of the world in 1878. As go-as-you-please rules were adopted, speed increased as the athletes learned how to incorporate trotting along with their walking. Several British runners started to reduce their 100-mile times close to 18 hours. Heaven knows I've got too far to go. 1878 was truly a landmark year in ultra running. The era of the 100-mile runner began, allowing runners with long-distance skills to enter the sport of pedestrianism or ultra running. The long-standing 1824 100-mile record of 17 hours 52 minutes set by Edward Rayner of England was then about 54 years old. No one else had reached 100 miles in less than 18 hours, not until 1878. A long-distance championship of England was held at the end of October 1878 in Agricultural Hall in the form of a six-day race. The track provided was 10 feet wide, covered with dirt. There were 23 runners. About 10,000 spectators were on hand when Henry Lower Brown of Fulham, England, broke the 18-hour barrier, reaching 100 miles in 17 hours, 54 minutes. Now that's fast! Whoa! Eight runners that day reached 100 miles in less than 24 hours. A day after the six-day race was finished, another historic six-day race began, also in Agricultural Hall. It was for, quote, second-class men who had been excluded from the championship race the week before. George Hazel of England was in the field and certainly had a chip on his shoulder being left out of the main race a week earlier. He was a celebrated long-distance runner and had beat some of the best runners in England at distances up to 12 miles. At the start, Hazel shot into the lead and kept increasing his lead during the day. He surprised everyone when he broke the 100-mile world record with a time of 17 hours, 4 minutes, and went on to win the six-day race. Several years later, in 1882, Hazel became the first man ever to reach 600 miles in six days. Following the footsteps of Madame Moore of 1869, covered in episode 54, more women started to compete in 100 milers in the late 1870s. Walking among women started to take hold in England. It was observed. The English girls are great walkers and they diverge from the state roads and make excursions among the mountains. But at the same time, there was concern about American women. American girls are generally poor walkers, and it soon will be a difficulty to find an American lady who can walk more than 20 minutes without complaining of fatigue. They pay too much attention to the shape and make of their boots for pedestrian performances. But all that would change quickly as American women took center stage among American pedestrians during the late 1870s. One of the most peculiar features of the walking mania is the number of lady pedestrians now on stage, and the surprising speed and power of endurance which they exhibit. Bertha von Hillern was born in Freiburg, Germany. Her mother encouraged and trained her in deeds of strength and endurance. She joined in with boys in walking contests, and she would outlast them all. They would, quote, gaze with mortified astonishment at the little figure, quiet, moving silently and steadily on toward the goal. In November 1876, she competed with May Marshall of Chicago for six days in a building in the Central Park Garden in New York City. There is some curiosity among medical men to test the powers of endurance of women, and several physicians will be present throughout the contest. The track they walked on was four feet wide and laid out as big as possible for the hall the race was held in. 
but the loop was tiny, with 22 laps per mile. Soil and sawdust were laid down about 3 inches thick. Sleeping rooms were provided for them on the second floor by a long flight of stairs. Muscular female attendants rubbed them down with a liniment when they became stiff. Von Hillern won the race, reaching an amazing 323 miles. Her success is regarded as a surprising demonstration of the possibilities of women's endurance. It contains a valuable lesson to our girls in the benefits of pedestrian exercise for help. A month later, she walked 350 miles in six days at a music hall in Boston, Massachusetts, making 7,000 circuits around the track. Toward the last, the wonderful exhibition in the music hall became the sensation of the town and drew large Bostonian audiences. If the effect shall be to encourage in the women of Boston the practice of walking more, the natural result of rosy cheeks, bright eyes, and increased physical strength will surely follow. Her 300-mile shoes were put on display at Tuttle's Shoe Store and was attracting considerable attention. She became the darling of Boston, hero among the German-Americans, and was very famous across the country, recognized as the woman pedestrian champion. Von Hillern was also a 100-mile walker. She trained hard for her first 100-miler, walking four hours per day and one hour of gymnasium exercise per day. She put on many 100-mile exhibitions, performing them between 27 and 28 hours. Von Hillern was the most prolific 100-miler among men or women during 1877-78, achieving that distance at least 12 times during a one-year period. She also made an impact on women's shoes, introducing zero-drop styles. A Kansas newspaper commented, The female pedestrian of Washington, Bertha Von Hillern, walked 100 miles in 28 hours. She wears long, broad-soled shoes with low heels or without heels, and all the ladies of that wicked place are adopting her kind of shoe. Are there any Berthas in Kansas? So a lot of people ask, why would I need a zero-drop shoe? Zero-drop shoes simply help people run better, and we believe that they will help people to run with less injuries. May Marshall started competing in 1875. She was 25 years old from Chicago. After competing with Von Hillern in the 1875 six-day matches, Marshall also started to compete in 100-mile walks. Her first attempt was at the Music Hall in Boston, Massachusetts during March 1877. At mile 83, her feet were so sore and swollen that she tossed away her shoes and walked the rest of the way in stockings. The enthusiasm during her last mile was intense. The vast number of spectators present cheering her at the top of their voices and waving their hats and handkerchiefs as she put in two extra laps. Her time was 26 hours, 47 minutes, much faster than Von Hillern's best. Marshall tried again in July at New Bedford, Massachusetts, where she suffered terribly. At times she would hold both hands above her head as if in extreme agony and many ladies in the audience shed tears of pity. The committee begged her to stop, but when it was announced that she meant to continue, the large audience applauded enthusiastically, spurred on the fainting woman who could hardly stand alone and was carried around the track by men who held her up and hurried her on while fanning her. The band played The Girl I Left Behind Me. Kate Lawrence was a dressmaker from San Francisco, California. She took up long-distance walking in 1877, believing that she could walk 100 miles faster than Von Hillern. She did serious training during 1877 to ease up her walking miles. Her first 100-mile attempt occurred in September 1877 in Pacific Hall in San Francisco. She finished in 27 hours, 40 minutes, about the same pace normally accomplished by Von Hillern. In August 1878, Lawrence was ready for her next 100-miler to be held in Virginia City, Nevada. A reporter was eating dinner in a restaurant when Lawrence came in. She asked for a private room and a square meal. He said she came in, quote, 
with the frightened air of one avoiding the police. She whispered her order to the waiter for a big, thick steak, biscuits, and coffee. In a few minutes, the order was filled, and the woman began to eat as if she had not tasted food for 24 hours. Between every mouthful, she cast furtive glances at the door, seemingly constantly expecting someone. Soon, a short man entered, searched the restaurant, and found Lawrence. He glared at her and took away her food. The man was her trainer, Tom Keen. She had been on a pre-race starvation diet prior to her 100 miler the next day. King was furious and screamed expletives. Then he took her by the arm and led her away. After that exchange, evidently Lawrence fired him. The next day, Lawrence walked her 100 miler at Virginia City, Nevada. During that walk, her former agent tried to stop her walking by presenting a bond for an alleged death. Spectators paid the bond and the walk went on. A large audience witnessed the close of the walk and the excitement was intense. Malie Dupree was a French-American seamstress from Sparta, Wisconsin. She was a mother and at times would walk miles with her eight-year-old daughter, Minnie. She made her 100-mile debut in Buffalo, New York in 1878 and finished in 26 hours, 45 minutes. She soon set her goal to break 24 hours, a seemingly barrier. Earlier in 1877, Carrie Parker, a woman from Illinois, accomplished a 24-hour 100-miler. People believed it ruined her life and drove her to insanity. She was, quote, a raving maniac when she was brought before a court. Her father testified that ever since the walking match, his daughter had been suffering with great nervous prostration, and recently she suddenly conceived of the idea that her whole body was charged with electricity and she would not touch her feet to the floor. She was sent to an asylum. Was a sub-24 hour 100 miler too tough for women? Dupree made her first attempt to walk 100 milers in under 24 hours in July 1878 at Association Hall in La Crosse, Wisconsin. A course laid out with sawdust was constructed in a spacious hall with 17 circuits per mile. At 9 o'clock p.m., Madame Dupree made her appearance dressed in white tights with a short overdress reaching just below the loins and a bodice without sleeves. She is a woman above the medium height, probably 35 years of age, well developed but without superfluous flesh, and with sharp firm set but not attractive face. She walked with ease with full swinging steps. She reached 50 miles in 11 hours 49 minutes. She was less flushed and there were signs of paleness. She changed her costume, appearing in a ballet dress. In the end, she reached 91 miles in 24 hours and withdrew at the advice of a doctor. Her shoes seemed to be the biggest problem, leaving her feet swollen and blistered. Dupree was still determined to try again and was finally successful at Mankato, Minnesota with a time of 23 hours, 5 minutes in September 1878. During the walks, little Minnie would do impressions of Dan O'Leary, delighting the crowds. Indeed, she was putting on entertaining events, walking 100 miles about every month for a while. She was the fastest woman 100 miler up to that time and started to be referred to as the wonder of the world. I hear tell she's kind of fast. Is she ever... Exilda Lechapelle was a French-Canadian woman who began walking professionally in her early teens. In May 1878, she walked 100 miles in Janesville, Wisconsin, with an outstanding time of 25 hours, 48 minutes. The mayor, having heard that she had been compelled by her husband to walk against her will, tried to call her off the track, but she said, Nobody could compel me to walk or stop. Plucky little woman. 1878 concluded with a spectacular 100-mile performance by James Smith at the Opera House at South Bend, Indiana. The track was extremely tiny, 30 laps per mile. It was a very dizzy 100-mile challenge with 12,000 turns. Up to the 50th mile, the pedestrians showed no signs of fatigue. 
but after he had passed that, his right ankle began to grow lame from the frequent turning of corners, and he slackened his speed somewhat. Many spectators came to watch, and in the evening the house was full. As the timekeeper announced the laps on the last mile, each one was received with applause, and the walker acknowledged it by a spurt which proved that he was not entirely exhausted. As the 30th lap of the 100th mile was announced, Smith was not content, but spun around the track at a frightful speed, and the audience could not cheer enough. He finished with a time of 1826 and had broken the American best by 22 minutes. 1878 was a banner year during the 100 mile craze, with well more than 100 finishes in America and in England, including at least 22 100 mile finishes among the women. About a century would need to pass until there were more 100 mile finishes in a calendar year. Stay tuned for more 100 mile history. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs> <laughs>